been asked by a lot of people sending me emails and so forth about, uh, well, let's put it this way, many questions connected with modern day in the 20th century and all the rest of it. As you see, I'm not trying to stretch it out over here. It just takes a long time to do the 19th century correctly. So, uh, if in some future, let's put it this way, we can perhaps in some future occasion talk about, and I'm serious, how this plays out in the 20th century, which happens in very unusual ways. Only in connection with the Lithuanian yeshiva will the story compel me to take it into the 20th century, because that's where the uh, uh, most unexpected developments in that regard uh, happen. But as for the others, it's hard enough to finish the 19th century. And uh, the argument that I'm making here in this entire uh, lecture series is that, as you know, the current state of things has its origins. Those who remain religious in the modern era belong to four identifiable trends. But these trends have an entire history of their own, and to do the play out and the changes that kick in in the 20th century uh, is an entire separate schmooze. So I just want to say that instead of having to send an email to all of you who contact me about that all the time. Unfortunately, you'll just have to hold your breath. Now, um, tonight I'm supposed to uh, give the second half of Term der Herz, as they call it, which is the form of uh, Judaism, Orthodox as opposed to traditional, that's the terms I'm using here, uh, that play out in the 19th and actually the early 20th century in, uh, in Germany. Uh, not only in Germany, but primarily. And uh, I gave a great deal of attention last week to the person and the thoughts and the writings of Saint Sarah Fulrich, because he's a seminal figure in it, obviously. But I want to be very clear, especially when you're talking in terms of social reality, most people do not read his writings. Uh, they're too voluminous and most people aren't readers. I don't think most people here uh, have read the 19 letters, even though you can, or the Chorev, or any of these other sorts of things, because he writes at very great length. And uh, that was true then also. So don't think that every person who is, quote unquote, a modern Orthodox Jew, a German Orthodox Jew, is a ideological follower in all aspects of Rabbi Simpson. But nevertheless, it is a fact that he did articulate a model, an ideology, and an image which resonated among all these Jews who chose voluntarily to remain loyal to the two core elements of traditionalism which characterize, of course, modern orthodoxy, German neo-orthodoxy, and I keep coming back to them because they are the core elements, or at least that's my point. And they are uh, nomianism and, and fundamentalism. That is to say, a commitment to keeping all of the laws, and also a commitment to all of the beliefs. And when I say the core beliefs, the old traditional beliefs about God, first of all, which is up for grabs in the 19th century, and about the Torah and Klal Yisrael in it, which are things that I imagine, looking at this audience, always take for granted, but, you know, in many other audiences, whether in Baltimore or elsewhere, would not be taken for granted. So, it's important to keep this in mind as I proceed. Now, uh, I talked, and I brought you up in terms of the narrative, to when Sanser Hirsch, in his career, when he was in his 40s, became the rabbi of this congregation in Frankfurt, which he uh, built up and uh, started with a, when he came to the 100 families, by the time he finished it was something like 380 families in, in that regard. That was a substantial growth, but it wasn't a million people at all. And it's only one community in Germany, Frankfurt. Uh, there are many others. And what we have to look for are trends which are replicated elsewhere in this environment and which prove to have some kind of significant uh, impact as opposed to something happened in one town in one place, even though that would be interesting in, in and of itself. And in the case of Hirsch, uh, a key element of what he develops uh, can be described <coughs> along two lines. One is the notion of the modern in the modern orthodoxy, which means that whether he said it or not, 
everything about him and everything about his program was calculated to compete with the other forms of Judaism out there. Uh, precisely to make the point that one does not have to abandon nomianism and fundamentalism in order to have the advantages that other streams of Judaism offer. So put it in plain English, I can build a shul just as fancy as yours. I can have a chasen just as high class as yours. Not an organ, but you can have a very fancy service with a choir without an organ. One can go to college and have the same degree and still be a Shomer Shabbos. That idea, and still be, lies at the very core element of the modernity and the orthodoxy. That the very lifestyle itself is the argument. You see that it is possible to partake of modernity, and yet it is not necessary at the same time in order to do that, to yield <laughs> core elements of Judaism. Unless you want to end up in the uh, famous and ridiculous position of the Irish uh, constitutional scholar who said that I am prepared to sacrifice half the Constitution and, if necessary, uh, both halves of the Constitution in order to preserve the remainder. <laughs> it is not necessary. The argument went. The lifestyle goes. The service. The education. The, frankly, the economic success. Because a key part, and Many of us my age and older and so forth, you know, grew up with this light motif. The uh, non-religious people are the rich ones. You see? They're the ones who have uh, the economic uh, success. The religious ones aren't. This was true in America when the first ones coming over were these immigrants in, in you know, in East Baltimore and East St. Louis, wherever, you know, the, the old neighborhood was. But what St. Serifil Hirsch uh, was able to argue, because I told you before, he had people like... Baron Rothschild, and other bankers and significantly economically successful individuals in his congregation that uh, he can make the argument and make it stick that uh, the Orthodox tool actually has more money than the Reform. And this was true in his time. And if that's true, but then it kind of upsets the apple cart because most Jews in Germany, as I suspect in other places, weren't ideologically enthusiastic adherence of the philosophy and the doctrines of Reform Judaism. But rather they saw it as being congenial to the type of life they wished to pursue. And what a person like Hirsch who wore a tuxedo on Friday night, who uh, as I said before was able to project a persona of being more educated and more cultured than uh, his competitors. What he was doing is saying, you've made a bad bargain. They're like Esau, you've sold your birthright for a mess of pottage. And that it's not necessarily to do, it is not necessary to do so. Now, did he persuade anyone, I want to be very clear about this, who was, shall we say, reform or liberal to change? No. Uh, he didn't try. Because the partisan feelings were so strong that uh, this was not going to happen in the middle of the 19th century. It wasn't going to happen. But what he was trying to do was hold the fort to persuade those traditionalists who are moving into his community and similar communities who are, or their children are, making the choices about which direction they want to go in life. And what he was trying to say to them was, uh, you can still have everything, so to speak, uh, and yet remain a Shomer Shabbos, and remain a Shomer term business. He never uses this language because that would be non-idealistic. As a matter of fact, it's very interesting to read his writings in which he always says, and he meant it, especially in his most famous essay called Religion Allied to Progress, Religion and the Bonnement de Fortune, that uh, if it were necessary for us to give up all the money, we would do so. If it were necessary for us to take an economic hit in order to remain religious, we'd be fully prepared to do so. But it's not necessary. So the rhetoric, the rhetorical style, is the man. Right? You get across the point you're trying to make, that a person has to be prepared uh, to make sacrifices for Shabbos, to make sacrifices for other things as well. But it's not necessary in the modern German economy, in the modern European world, to do so if one is determined to make the necessary adjustments. This is a powerful, very powerful message. 
as I say before, this message resonated a lot more than the uh, doctrines and the styles that one finds in the philosophical writings and in the many volumes of philosophical writings of Rav Hirsch. So if this was an academic uh, seminar in intellectual history, and I've been to those, you can talk about the fine points of this person's religious philosophy or uh, you know, outlook versus that one's. And that's interesting on its own. But that is not my goal in this. I'm more trying to persuade, give you a kind of social history in short because that's where I argue the reality uh, happens. And in that regard, the, the image of Ralph Hirsch in the minds of the public was what I tried to describe now. Now, uh, that's not all it is. Because a very key element of everything I'm describing is the idea of boundaries. That Hirsch established and made it very clear from the very beginning that the definition of orthodoxy is not the others. You know, defining yourself in opposition to others. And that means that one has to take very strong stands of uh, condemnation and most importantly, delegitimation of others, of other groups, not of people. He never indulges, very interestingly, in all of his writings, in personalities. He doesn't stoop to that. He does not get into the gutter. But he, at the same time, very clearly makes it point, makes the point that uh, to Jews such as himself, to what do we call the true Jews, uh, there are no other legitimate forms of Judaism. And that all the others are just that. And uh, this obviously provoked a great deal of controversy, and that leads to the controversial side of St. Samuel Flourish. So it's not really true that we're simply talking about modern orthodoxy, being American, and at the same time, Shabbat Shabbos. It's a lot more than that. And it certainly developed in unexpected ways in Germany and gave uh, the particular Western Orthodoxy a particular view, which was interestingly different than what one found in Eastern Europe, where more traditional values, less modern values, prevailed often down to the Holocaust. So it's very interesting to find a more ideologically rigid position in certain issues. In Western Europe, in places like Frankfurt and Germany, than one would find in Vilna. But such was the case. What am I speaking about? In the particular case of Germany, you had an issue which we do not have in this country at all, and that is Kahila politics. And the reason we don't have it is we don't have a Kahila. Not a formal, real Kahila. In places like Baltimore, what you have is an organically developed set of institutions which function in the place of a Kahila. Let me put it this way. There's a mikvah in town which is a separate and independent corporation. There's something else in town which is a separate corporation called the Vatikashas. There's something else in town called the Eruv. There's something else in town called the TA and the Beis Yaakov and so forth. And uh, they don't belong to any overarching body. They don't report to anyone except their own board of directors. And uh, nevertheless, they serve in de facto as communal institutions. You and I partake of them. And uh, that's the American way. Because there can be no formal and coercive structure in a country whose constitution, uh, or the Bill of Rights, prohibits any kind of government establishment of religion. By contrast, in Europe, this is not the case. I'm sure many know, for example, that the Queen of England, at least when the book is out of the Church of England. That is to say, even though Britain is a democratic country, that does not mean that they adhere to the doctrine of the separation of church and state. So the two are not identical. Just, you can have a democratic country and at the same time have an established church. The founders of this country were very uncomfortable with that idea. But found in Europe, that is not the case. And so, for example, in the 19th century in Germany, the idea of the Kehila still existed as a legal institution. And by the way, still does in many places in Germany to this day. Which means that, by law, certainly in the 19th century, and even, as I say, surprisingly today, uh, you're Jewish, you live in a certain place in Germany, um, 
part of your taxes go to the support of your particular religious institutions. They call it church and starter. And uh, down to the, down today, till today. And uh, in those days, uh, you didn't even have an option. When you were born uh, to a Jewish uh, family, you were enrolled by the state authorities as a member of the Jewish community. In fact, it's very interesting that they had a Christian way of looking at it. And so, according to the laws that prevailed once upon a time in the German Empire and the Austrian Empire, once upon a time, uh, you're not a Christian until you have your baptism, whereupon you become legally a member under the law of the Christian community, and you're not Jewish until you have the circumcision. <laughs> which therefore leads to the very famous and interesting law suits in the 1850s and 1860s for Jewish parents who do not want to circumcise their children and nevertheless want to be considered members of the Jewish community. And then you have the issue of the Kut Achtungen, which is you have to get expert opinions from these rabbis and those rabbis. Is one a Jew whether or not they're circumcised? And uh, it got very uh, interesting. The point is that these things are unthinkable to us in the American context. Take those glasses off and put on 19th century European glasses to understand what I'm about to speak about. And in that world, all over Germany, for example, there were legally government-recognized and organized communities to which you have to belong unless you convert and which you have to pay taxes to. I don't say a whole lot of taxes, but, you know, a certain percentage. And they are no longer in the 19th century in a situation of coercing you to keep Shabbos or not keep Shabbos, but on the other hand, there are such things as burials, you know, and uh, communal institutions, and, uh, you know, w which way is the synagogue going to go? Is it going to go to the ref left or the right? And Chinuch, uh, such as it is in different places, how will that be run? And these are matters that are under the purview and the control of what we in Baltimore call the Associated, and those there, it would be an actual formal group that had elections, each community under its own system, each German state under its own system, actually. And uh, therefore, the Gemeinde, or the Kehillah, it counts. Now, for example, in Frankfurt, where Hirsch became the rabbi of this shul, uh, the Kehillah was opposed to the existence of the shul. And they got it in any ways, I tried to describe last week, uh, in the Revolution of 1848. But even afterwards, uh, they really tried to uh, get it closed down because they said that the board of directors and the community uh, feels that this is an inappropriate institution and uh, they never quite succeeded but nevertheless that was the environment all through the 1850s and early 1860s that you know your shoal which is a sub-community of a sub-community is always in danger of being closed down through some kind of government action you and I know with hindsight it never happened but they didn't know it at that time so feelings are very bitter over this kind of subject. And as I tried to describe last week, yeah, you have to pay your taxes to the Kehillah, and then you have to take an extra hit in the pocket to pay for your day school, and for your synagogue maintenance, and all the rest of it. And indeed, I dare say, had they had not had members such as uh, Rothschild, they probably you know, wouldn't have survived. But they made it a point of honor to do so, and this was replicated all across Germany. But this was not only in Frankfurt, this in many other places, in which people had to pay money and uh, similar kinds of support to the official communities, and then you had to do your own thing. By the way, it runs both ways. There were places, not many, in Germany, where the Orthodox were in charge of the kill. And then they tried to get the reform minion closed down. And this is how it, uh, Halberstadt is a very famous case, and this is uh, how uh, politics uh, ran in those days. We have a different way of doing it in this country, as I said before, but uh, that was the good old-fashioned Jewish wars of the 19th century. Now, in the case of St. Serenville Hirsch, throughout the 1850s and 60s, when he first 20 years, 25 years of his career, um, he had no option but to function as a minion within the community. Now, it's true, they built a big shoal, which was fancier than the other shoals, and they made sort of like a model school with a beautiful building on the rest of it. It was just a minion. In German, the term is Religionsgesellschaft, which means just a little religious corporation, what you and I call a minion. And uh, it ticked them off. And the reason it ticked them off for people like Sansa Rivers and others is because, first of all, why do these people tell us how to run our community? Second of all, we are the, we're not a minion, we're actually the real shul. 
The official shul is a bizarion. <coughs> the official synagogue and the official community is run by sinners. If you want to get down to it. They're a Chalali Shabbos. They don't believe in God. Not as we understand the term. They don't believe in the Torah. They're Chazar Fressers. <laughs> what gives them the right to claim the noble title of a Kihila? Is this just a power struggle? This is how he articulated it. And in other words, he raised it to the level of religious ideology. And uh, this is an uncomfortable uh, way to go. I mean, if we start doing that in Baltimore or elsewhere, we'll get a lot of fights in our hands. But he did it. And uh, all through, for 25 years, imagine, they're doing it. And uh, the community itself is always outraged. And, uh, you know, how they shut this guy up. And they can't do it. And so they simply have to tolerate it. And then comes, in the 1870s, a change in the uh, political environment. I guess I don't have a pointer here, but if you can look at that map, which indicates Europe from, uh, I hope you can see it all, uh, after 1870, uh, what happens is that uh, Bismarck created the German Empire, which means he took all those patchwork of states. Do we have the uh, point anywhere? It's on the keyboard. It's not quite the same thing. The, uh, but you see that area over there all became one, one uh, empire, one country. Uh, like the United States, composed of separate different states. Except in Germany with separate different king kingdoms. And uh, I might add, as a little but important uh, note, that uh, Frankfurt itself was occupied and conquered and annexed by <coughs> Prussia. Uh, shortly before this period, in 1866, the result of European wars, which meant that he was now under the more rigid rule of Prussia. Anyway, that will matter in a few minutes. Uh, in 1870 and 1871, the Germans got their act together, and under the leadership of Prince Bismarck, created the German Empire under uh, the King of Prussia, the Kaiser, as you uh, remember. And um, when that happened, uh, there was a brief period of liberalism in the 1870s, uh, sweeping Germany, which after a short while was, you know, suppressed by a counter-reaction of uh, right-wing reactionaryism. That's European politics. During this relatively brief but important period, uh, in the 1860s and 70s in Germany of the liberalism, so uh, there was sort of a window of opportunity, you might say, in terms of legislation. This is, for example, when Germany, before anyone else, passes Social Security, unemployment insurance, all the social welfare institutions that we're so familiar with. Uh, the Germans did it before anyone else, long before anyone else, believe it or not. And uh, Bismarck, of all people. Well, one of the things that happens is they pass laws in, in, in Prussia that if you belong to a certain Christian denomination and you don't like your uh, particular uh, religious hierarchy, uh, different Protestant ones, you can secede, you can get out and make your own. So, uh, again, to us Americans, it seems all strange. But in Europe, it's not strange. And for the first time, one is permitted to uh, change the rules of the game. For the first time, one is permitted under the law to say, I don't want to be a member of religious group A, and you, the state, are telling me what the religious group A is, but I want to make my own. And um, as I say before, this was first done in a Christian Protestant context. Well, when Sam Strangel Hirsch finds out about this, he says, I want to do this too. And I want to make a, my community in Frankfurt not just a minion with a big shul, uh, but a completely separate uh, and independent community. In fact, it's, it will then be the reassertion, for the first time, of the genuine community. Because we're the Shomer Shabbos, we do believe in God, we do believe in Judaism. Although they call us Orthodox, actually, he says, we're just really Jewish. And you aren't. And uh, obviously... This provoked a lot of controversy because when you delegitimate someone else, they say, what do you mean we're not? But he had no hesitation in, in, in very strongly advocating this. And he got it passed. He actually went to a Jewish liberal parliamentarian, member of parliament in Germany, in the Reichstag, who was completely not religious, but who uh, was committed to, uh, what shall we say, separation of church and state, uh, Edward Lasker. And, uh, and he made the argument to him on... Uh, 
I guess what we would call American terms, which is everyone should have the right to do whatever they want within the religious context, and he got it passed. I can assure you, the German Reichstag didn't care one way the Orthodox or, or the conservative or the others. But since Lasker was such a powerful parliamentarian, they said, well, let's, let's do my favor. He has this Jewish bill. Who cares? And, uh, and that's, how it got, that's how it got done. And I might say that this was uh, a firestorm because the reform and many other groups very strongly protested against it. And here we come across something very interesting. They said this is absolutely opposed to Jewish tradition. And it was in a certain way. Because a key element, as I've described in earlier classes, of Jewish tradition, and this is something you and I are not familiar with in America. We've lost it. But once upon a time, this was absolutely part and parcel of being Jewish. Not only does it mean you're sh being Jewish is not only a matter of being Shomer Shabbos. Yes, it was. Not only a matter of believing God in the Torah, all the rest of it. That too. Part of being Jewish was being part of a formal kahila, which includes every Jew in the, you know, urban area. The good and bad, the ugly. Yeshiva Shomayla, Yeshiva Shomato, Anamatirno Hespalo Marionim, as we said, Kol Nidre. So we have the sinners and the righteous, all the rest of it, are all part of the community. Ironically, the people like the Reform Jews and the sector Jews made the argument that if one undertakes now to say there are two communities, or three or four, you're breaking the union. You're breaking something which is old and sacred. And you can understand where they're coming from. The only thing is, Sansa Reva Hirsch said like this, you're taking one piece of the pie and blowing it all out of proportion and ignoring the important core elements of the rest. In other words, how can you say like this, I don't believe in God, not in the biblical sense, I don't believe someone created the world. I don't believe uh, that the Bible really represents what it says it is. Bible critics tell us it's something different. I don't really believe, I don't believe, they would say, in keeping Shabbos. I don't say they don't keep Shabbos, they don't believe in it, or kosher, all the rest of it. But we do believe in traditionalism to the degree that everybody has to be, be a member of the Kehillah. He says that what you're doing then is mutating. You're taking a piece of the mosaic and giving it undue emphasis, and therefore you are perverting Judaism. You are perverting the entire Jewish philosophy. And they say, no, we're not. And so this argument was very bitter, and he got the law passed. And after he got the law passed, two things happened. Most religious Jews in Germany uh, don't want to secede, even his own community. Most religious Jews in Germany said, it's okay to get the law passed, but that doesn't mean we're actually going to do it. Right? Because how can I say, for example, in Frankfurt or elsewhere, I'm not part of the Frankfurt Jewish community. Uh, I've always been. My parents have always been. My great-grandparents donated the mikvah, you know. How can you do that? That's part of who we are. My relatives are buried in the cemetery. How can we deny that? This is unnatural. Right? It's like being uh, sharp, sharper than a serpent's tooth. And uh, Hirsch says, no, 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 you have to follow conviction, and you have to follow consistency, and you have to be prepared even for radical measures. And they said, well, we're not. You know, we don't like it. And it was a big fight. In fact, in his own community, you know, less than 100 people, I think, uh, did actually go to court and take an oath, because that's what the law required. And you say, I, you know, Chaim Schwartz, whatever, now uh, swear, that's what he had to do, that uh, I have no connection, I renounce all membership in the Jewish community in Frankfurt. It was a traumatic experience. Now, again, this is so unusual for us Americans. The whole issue never arises. For which you can thank, I guess, the founding fathers. But in Europe, it wasn't like that. And uh, this proved to be a highly emotionally charged and traumatic issue for many Jews throughout the German Empire and in other places in Europe where this was implemented, mainly what you see over here, Central Europe. You can, if you see the map, I'm pointing up here is Germany, and down here, this whole area is the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And two weeks ago or, or so, I described that a very similar thing was happening in Hungary at precisely the same time. As a matter of fact, it happened in Hungary a few years before it happened in Germany. And uh, if you really trace the historical antecedents of this, uh, Sansa Reva Hirsch's son-in-law was a big rabbi in Hungary. He was pushing this idea over there. Um, but it was, as I say, the political football of the second half of the 19th century. 
and it really divided families and, uh, and Jews uh, across the board. I would point out something very interesting. It put a big break on the progress of reform and even conservative Judaism in Germany because once it became legally possible for any group in the community to secede, to break away, because they don't like the way the community is being run, all of a sudden anybody who wants to implement another reform to put in an organ or to abolish a school or make some kind of significant change in the way the cemetery is operated uh, knows that there will be consequences, that these five or ten or maybe fifty from it, these Michigan <laughs> will secede. And hear this well, how will we look in the eyes of the Goyim? That's exactly what they say. Because in Germany particularly, they're very conscious of their religious profile. And in a conservative environment such as in Central Europe, the strongest argument for Jewish validity is that we are strong, we're Gazette's Troy. We're loyal to the laws of our ancestors. That we follow traditions. Even a German who's not Jewish can understand that and can respect it. If it turns out that you're a bunch of fakers, that you're not loyal to anything, that you're just following laws of ease, that the reason you want to be, as they call it, reform, is so you won't have to adhere to all the restrictions of Shabbos, all the, you have no respectability whatsoever. Then you're just a bunch of seekers after uh, luxury and ease, and you have no religious grounding, and uh, that was a big blow a low blow they felt. And therefore, it became very much in the interest of every community board of directors and not to alienate after 1876. Any of the traditionalists in the community, lest it lead to a break, which would be to them the biggest kill <laughs> Hashem possible. Because what you're saying is, the community is regarded by even the religious members of the community as something phony. I can't emphasize to you within the, you know, how painful such a uh, article in newspapers would be to Jewish leaders and regular members in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, in Central Europe, had this come out. And so, whether or not one actually agreed with the stance of Sensor David Hirsch that it's necessary to break the community, to draw lines, whether one agreed with that or not, it's a fact that the very existence of the law put an absolute break on any kind of progress of non-Orthodox Judaism in the religious sense in, in Europe. And it's very interesting. People often talk about, oh yeah, Germany reformed Judaism and this and that and the other. Actually, it was rather weak and anemic in Europe. It was in the United States that reformed Judaism took off, amazingly, starting in the 1850s and 60s and reaching a crescendo in the 1870s and early 80s. Uh, not over there. Because, among other things, there was now a powerful legal dynamic which stood in the way of doing any kind of actions or activities which might, God forbid, lead to a public split within the uh, Kehillah. Now, I emphasize all this because what it means is that Hirsch was saying that if you want to be religious, you have to define yourself in opposition to those who are not religious the way you are. You have to define yourself as the true Jews, and everybody else as the phony Jews. Now, not in a halachic sense, of course. But I didn't deny, deny the fact, that the last one's not the fact, that everyone's a Jew, whose mother's a Jew. That was never the issue. And also, I might add, not even in the political sense. If it came, and Hirsch was very clear about this, if it came to fighting anti-Semitism, and there was plenty of anti-Semitism in Germany, I don't have to tell you. You know, in the 1870s and 80s, there was actually a party in the Reichstag, uh, democratically elected, called the Anti-Semitic Party. They, they won seats. Uh, think about that. Uh, and in different German states, they prohibited Schrita. And there was all kind of difficulties over there. And Hirsch was never saying that we're not a community of fate. And so, in contemporary American terms, he said, we all belong to the ADL or something like that. But on the other hand, anything other than that uh, we are very different. Uh, we're so different that we're like two religions. He uses those words. We're like two religions. 
And uh, what he was doing, obviously, was taking the position that is necessary to draw a line in the sand, to circle the wagons, and to define halonu ato o litzarenu. You say you're Jewish, what do you mean by that? Who do you side with? There are two groups. There's these and these. And you have to choose. And a lot of people, as you know, even today, and certainly then, don't like to choose. And most people say, get off my back. Who told you? Who made you God that I have to choose? And so I can tell you again that many, many disagreed with what he advocated. Many agreed with him. This split among the Central European Orthodox Jews and the modern Orthodox Jews is a portent split that characterize the Orthodox community today. We are not a uh, monolithic, identical community. Uh, there are some very strong, and have been for a long time, different opinions about ideology within the framework of orthodoxy. In the ideological sense, they trace themselves back to what I just described, to the Central European environment, the political environment, and the cultural environment that you saw in the second half of the 19th century. Now, the whole story is not about sensory hurts. The um, fact is that there were other important rabbis who disagreed with him, and some agreed with him. Uh, in the case of Frankfurt, it turned into a very ugly uh, political, uh, uh, almost a scandal or a controversy, because when the Reformed Jewish community, or the, let's put it this way, when the official Kehillah, saw that he's trying to form an entirely separate group and get everyone to resign from the community, including some of the richest people in town. And they also perceived that many people are very hesitant to do so. They changed their attitude entirely and got very pragmatic. And they basically said, don't, I know you can do it. The law is passed now. You have the ability to do it. Don't do it. And let's work something out. Let us fall back upon the good old traditionalist values of one big hilla, and let's work it out. Let's make a deal. Right? We realize that we've been stepping on your toes now for 30 years. Okay, that was a mistake. Let's close that chapter, and let's open a new chapter. Let's be pragmatic about it. If we dwell on the past, it'll be negative. Uh, as is often the case with relationships, it may be good just to concentrate on the future. And uh, we will be willing to, uh, obviously, have a completely different policy when it comes to funding. And instead of not giving a penny to your institutions, we'll actually give all the money, you know, we, we'll, we'll include it totally within the framework. Imagine how tempting this is. Imagine if in Baltimore, Maryland, the associates that will pay for full TA, <laughs> full Beisiago, full Rambam, no, no, no tuitions. <sighs> the, um... <laughs> yeah, where big people say, let's go. The, uh, but it's not funny. I have to tell you. <laughs> Think about that. So we'll, we'll pay full. <coughs> and Sam Sarif and Hirsch and many of the members of the community said, very good. You know, good move. You got that law passed. Now we have bargaining chip. Let's use it. And he said, I can do this for a bargaining chip. You know, I'm not, it's not Tammany Hall. It doesn't matter of principle. We're talking about the Torah over here. They say, yes, I know, but tuition. <laughs> <laughs> and you can hear both sides. And uh, he then made a famous essay where he said, it's actually also al pidin to have any kind, to, 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 for religious people to spend any money that will go to support anti-Torah activities. So if I remain a member of the community and I'm forced, or now I choose, to pay taxes into one big uh, fund, part of that money goes to pay for kosher, Part of that money goes to pay for trade. So you tell me my money is also going to pay for trade. Should it support a reformed temple or something like that? That's absolutely awesome. They said, no problem, make two bank accounts. <laughs> yeah. Make two bank accounts. You know, the money will go here. So think, look what we're offering you. We're offering you free tuition in your own bank account. Come on. And the members of the committee said, like, let's go for it. <laughs> I mean, come on, you know. Like I said, it was a good move to get the law passed. Now we have very, some very, they, look how they changed their tune. But now, like an attorney, you know, let's be practical and, and, and sign something. And he said, in no way. And uh, he took such a strong position, totally principled, and he didn't get anything out of it, totally principled, that uh, many members of the community, particularly 
the old Frankfurters, people who were traditionalistic, you know, who were 20, 30 years older than him, who were, as we would say nowadays, more yeshivish. They said, free tuition? Come on, don't be stupid. Mm -hmm. And he said, it's also, he says, really, also? You know, to turn down a sweet deal like this? And uh, they went over his head. They appealed to another rabbi, a very famous rabbi, Bamberger, who was a, the, the Rome Würzburg, who was uh, a more yeshivish type, uh, who uh, did not have the Hirsch education and writing style. Um, Zelman Bamberger actually published a famous swarm in Halacha, and uh, for, I'll give you an example, on Chalitza, and things of this nature, completely different uh, type. And he said, listen, if they're really offering that they're not going to make you do anything traif, and separate bank account, and free tuition, and free show, um, that's okay. <laughs> Which really meant that what you're saying is like this. Ramosha Moshe Feinstein said it's all right. And a modern equivalent. Well, obviously, this was very insulting <coughs> to the Mara de Asra, to Hirsch himself. He said, how dare you go over my head? And he got into a very hot correspondence with the Würzburg Rub. How, you, how come you even interfere in something that's a local issue? And they had sharp exchange between them. And uh, the whole thing became, as I said before, very unpalatable and uh, became a political, uh, a divisive political football down until the Holocaust. You see? What I'm describing took place in 1877, so it's 60 years, right? 65 years. All the way down that period, and if you talk to the old German Jews of a certain age or whatever, if you would talk, for example, to Rabbi Schwab about this, or uh, you know, you, 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 you get the full story. And no, the bitterness would still be there. And uh, the Gemeinde, the Kehillah, the Reform Group, they realized that they were making a appeal over the heads of Hirsch to his own Balaban. They liked that. And what they eventually did was um, they said, okay, you will keep your own shul. We're not going to interfere. You're obviously a fanatic. I mean, you know, nobody can talk to you. But uh, that's what they said. But uh, what about the rest of you Balabatim out there? We will set up, pay out of communal funds, a separate orthodox shul uh, within the community. Einheitsgemeinde, as they call it, will be part of the uh, general Kehillah. It'll be run by you in whatever way you want. And, uh, and we'll fund it, as I said before. We'll, we'll fund a separate day school. And full tuition and so forth. And, uh, and how about it? And many Jews in the, in the Franklin community do that. Because they say, I don't want to give up the cemetery. And I don't want to give up the, you know, the connection with my cousins. My cousins are reformed, but they're still my cousins. You see? And uh, I know they're not doing the right thing, but I don't consider them to be traitors. And you can hear the feelings on both sides, and you can understand the feelings that are very strong and bitter uh, within communities. And I might say that... Uh, the reform went so far as to uh, name, to, to elect a new chief rabbi of Frankfurt, a uh, from the, uh, Rabbi uh, Horowitz. So it was a Talmud Chacham, who said his own yeshiva in the city. And so you have to understand the crazy situation you're talking about. I mean, here you have the Hirsch community with their own entire network of institutions, and here you have a parallel network of Orthodox institutions, and here you have a third network of reform institutions. And this is Jewish politics. Okay. <laughs> Now, I know here in America we know nothing of multiple school systems. <laughs> but it goes to show you the impact of modernity and ideology in completely unprecedented ways. Fifty years before that, a hundred years before, such a thing would have been unthinkable. It was just the Jewish community. It was just the Jewish way of doing things. No longer. The impact of new movements, of modern ways of thinking, of different levels of comfort with the outside culture uh, resulted in this rather crazy quilt network and complex of parallel institutions which we are so familiar with today. I mean, theoretically, there should be, you know, just like there's one JCC for everybody, there should be one school system for everybody, there should be one everything for everybody, it doesn't work that way. As a matter of fact, they get more and more all the time. They multiply more and more all the time. And uh, that's considered the norm. And this traces itself back in unexpected ways to the modern Orthodox. What I just described did not happen 
in Russia. Did not happen in Poland, in Krakow, in Warsaw, in Vilna, in Minsk, and places like that. Not in the 19th century. Well, it happened after the First World War, though. It's happening in Germany, as I say, because of the impact of the politics of the new order. Now, um, as I said before, I've been concentrating on uh, one particular aspect of this because it's a very important one. There's another very important aspect of Hirsch and others, uh, the, the uh, set of values and, and uh, lifestyle and uh, system of beliefs that they uh, put into place, and that has to do with some of the raging current intellectual issues in the 19th century that I spoke about a couple weeks ago, namely idealistic philosophy on the one hand, and particularly historicism on the other. Um, many Jews in Germany, once they got a college education or something similar to that, reacted to that by abandoning traditionalism. But they did so for intellectual reasons, at least that's what they said. And uh, one of the most powerful of this, as I tried to describe a couple weeks ago, was historicism. How can you believe the Bible if uh, there's no historical evidence for it? If you can't believe that, then forget everything else. And others would attack, for example, uh, say maybe the Bible is okay, but the Talmudism and you know di different points. You see, if you're an Orthodox Jew, it means, among other things, that you're subscribing to a particular narrative with all kinds of chains along the way. The Chumash, the Nach, the Gemara, the Bayes Rishon, the Bayes Shani, what we generally call the Rishonim, the Ahronim, and all that, you, you, you subscribe to a, a chain. If you break any one of those chains, uh, then it doesn't work. Then you're not Orthodox anymore. We're not usually uh, taught this way. It's sort of taken in with the mother's milk. This is, uh, you know, something that's uh, uh, taken for granted. But Orthodox Judaism, Torah Judaism, does mean, ultimately, you subscribe to a particular version of the past. And... Uh, the entire legitimacy of who we are depends on a particular version of the past. I always, that's why I always love you. People say Is it Jewish history, this and the other. I mean, and in point of fact, whether they realize they're not everybody's standing on a particular version of Jewish history. On the other hand, they never meant the history as we understand it now in the universities. They meant the narrative of the tradition. Like I said before, most Jews, all Jews, had a general idea of what I just described without going into particulars. Yeah, there's the Chumash, the Tanakh, by Rishon, by Shem, you know, all that sort of thing. Enough to situate me where I am right now here and ground me and my identity in a particular version which validates everything that I do. Uh, the details uh, were never necessary. Now comes the 19th century. All of a sudden the details are everything. This was a century, particularly in Germany, but eventually in the United States and everywhere else, in which the modern study of history comes into its own. That is to say, scholars adopt certain types of methodology which enable them to make the claim that they are accessing the scientific truth about the past, which means they know actually what happened. That's the claim. Mm -hmm. As the most famous historian in the 19th century said, we know now via agency visit. We know how it actually was. I can tell you what Henry VIII really was like, or Julius Caesar. But that's not true. And, uh, no, within two or three generations, you have what a famous person described as the crisis of German historicism, when they started to question that themselves. So I'm not going to get too far into that particular uh, intellectual historical vein. But not in the period I'm talking about. People thought that they now are accessing, through the new methodologies, old records, uh, original documents, first sources, comparisons, which enable you to shed the myths that so many people subscribe to in the past. And uh, when Jewish students went through schools, and particularly universities, they come out of it, they say Judaism is what the historians tell us it is. Uh, not what the rabbis tell us it is. It's a very interesting point I just made. And uh, there were no historians telling what Jewish past is, because as far as the non-Jewish professors, Jews don't have a history. Some of you may remember Arnold Toynbee. Jews don't have a history. They're a group like the Eskimo. They don't count. History in the 19th century is only for Khashiv groups, which means Western Europe. You know, the Italians have a history. The Germans and the French and the British, of course, have a history. Uh, the uh, Hottentots don't have a history. The Aborigines don't have a history. The Jews don't have a history. 
They're not a country, they said. They don't have a land. They don't really have a language that they speak. They want to speak different things. It's a hodgepodge of beliefs. And like Arnold Toynbee said, they have no business even being there. They're a fossil. Should have gone out of business long ago. This is part and parcel of the Western narrative, the Western myth, in which there is a progressive unfolding of the historical process. They don't call it God, they call it the historical process. And uh, you see, you know, Middle Ages, the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Age of Reason, the Enlightenment, and us today. And little by little, every way and every day, things are getting better and better. And there are other groups out there in the world who haven't realized that, and, you know, they're fossils of history. They'll either disappear or they get with the program. Everybody will eventually Europeanize, or they won't, and they'll disappear. That was the reigning Jewish belief. And uh, if you're a Jewish student, you go to school, uh, chances are you'll pick up this ideology and philosophy and not view it as an ideology, as a philosophy, but as what they call quote-unquote scientific truth uh, because everybody else around you is. And uh, this led to many good Jews. I would emphasize, they're not bad people. Many good Jews saying, you know what I was taught at home is not true. What the professor taught me is true, or he's at least put me on to like Oedipus, ways of exploring the past that will give me a completely different story and a, and, a, and a real truth about myself. So in other words, historicism was highly subversive to Jewish belief and obviously therefore to Jewish practice. And this was such a powerful movement that uh, some of the brightest Jewish intellectuals who went to universities or schools like that uh, became completely alienated from traditionalism well, at the same time, you know, they were completely committed to the study of the Jewish past. In German, they called it Wissenschaft des Judentums, which means the science of Jude Judaism, which therefore means that we're going to be Jewish by fully understanding what Judaism is. It has nothing to do with practice. It has nothing to do with Shabbos or Kashrus and things of that nature. It's getting the correct understanding of what Judaism is. That's the real Jew. The rest of you, you can be the Hasidim or it doesn't matter who, uh, you may have Jewish rituals, you don't really understand what Judaism is, and therefore you'll be second, second raiders. But we do. Mm -hmm. And they proceeded to publish books, do uh, a lot of historical research, go into many old libraries and, uh, you know, places like the Vatican, for example, and, 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 and other uh, museums, where there really were a lot of very important artifacts and sources <laughs> really were there. But all of it based upon historicist principles, which means that if you want to know what the truth of anything is, the truth lies in its in the correct interpretation of its past. That's a certain way of looking at it. You and I do that sometimes. If I ask you, describe yourself. For, you know, one way of doing it is to say, I'm so tall, I'm so uh, I'm not married, I'm not married, I like this food and the other, and you know, these are my favorite books. That's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it, and most of us would think it's a better way of doing it, a more sound way of doing it, is let me tell you myself. My parents were so-and-so, I was born in this place, this or I went to school. These are my life experiences. What are you doing when you tell me that? You tell me, if you know my past, you know who I am. And if you don't know my past, then you don't really know who I am. And so, many Jews, good ones, uh, came to embrace everything that I've just been talking about the last three, four minutes. And they said, we have to radically reinterpret Judaism. But they were not Reformed Jews. Uh, they said, we do not feel comfortable with an analysis of Judaism which says that the essence of Judaism does not comprehend the laws. That's what Reform Jews, ideological Reform Jews were saying. The essence of Judaism, the part that you can't throw away, everything else you can throw away, the essence of Judaism according to the Reform ideologists in the 19th century was that's it. There's nothing else that is an essential core of Judaism. That way, by the way, they could have a religion that is impossible to criticize. If your whole religion consists of what can you say? All the other parts about God, the Torah, Shabbos, Book of Joshua, <laughs> Sukkot, whatever you want, Maimonides, you can take them or leave them, literally. You take them or leave them. If they look usable, use them. If you don't look usable, you know, get rid of them. The half of Recha Kamocha you can't get rid of. Well, that is reducing, that, that's more like the guy I said before. He said, I'm willing to, to surrender the, the both halves in order to preserve the remainder. 
Uh, many Jews in Germany and Central Europe and elsewhere did not like this. They said, wait a minute, the modern science of hist history tells us that Judaism means Shabbos. I mean, how do you get around that fact? Jews from day one, as far back as our historical records are concerned, being a Jew means Saturday you do things called Shabbos. Jews have a different diet. How do we deny that? And so you had a clash between the new ideology of reform on the one hand and historicism on the other. But notice, these people did not say we believe in all the traditionalistic theologies of the past. Historicism, they would say, tells us it's not true. Uh, maybe Shabbos dates from some uh, custom they picked up from the Babylonians. That was a widely held belief among historians in the 19th century. Maybe Kashrus comes uh, from the Egyptians. Maybe some other group got picked up along the way. There are many customs we have that, you know, if you do your historical research, you can trace to this particular town and time, or that one, and uh, we can't really say it's halachal Moshe Mishinah, literally. And so what I'm trying to say is that there comes to gel in Europe a uh, very significant group in the 19th and 20th centuries uh, of people who are, and hear this well, who are committed to nomianism, but not fundamentalism. They do believe in the importance of keeping the Jewish laws. Uh, but they cannot do so and say they really believe in the validity of the Torah. Because to believe in the validity of the Torah means to subscribe to a particular version of the past. And they say, I can't do any good conscience. What I learned in school, what my historical research tells me, is, is, is this not true? I can't, I can't lie to myself. So I'll keep Shabbos, and I'll keep kosher, but not because I believe God said to do that. I, I can't make that leap of faith. And this is what you call conservative. The original name was positive historical, and uh, later on they came to be called in, in, in Germany liberal, Ju liberal Judaism. In America, you and I call it conservative Judaism. And uh, the people I describe are, as I think, were quite opposed to Reform Judaism. And uh, many included many distinguished uh, rabbis and Jewish scholars who had a lot of knowledge. And... Uh, the arguments they were making was what I just described to you. How can you deny the evidence of modernity? How can we deny what archaeology tells us? How can we deny what the history books show us? How can we deny what our historical research tells us? We just have to get used to the fact that a lot of the stories we were raised with are myths. But that does not mean uh, that we shouldn't keep Shabbos or the other laws. This was an approach which was congenial to many people because it really led them to feel that they are being intellectually honest, they're up with the latest currents of European thought, which is, after all, particularly in the 19th century, the truth. The latest thoughts are the truth. If the thoughts change between the 1830s and 40s, okay. If they change between the 1840s and 50s, okay. But they're up on the latest truth, what we call today the New York Times. And, well, and uh, at the same time, to make the case, but we're Jews just like our ancestors were. Because the definition of Jews were people who gathered together in Kehillah and kept certain things. And maintained certain institutions. Had a lifestyle. The Judaism was defi Judaism defined as the lifestyle. There are some people, they said, who still can't come to grips with what we just said. And, uh, you know, one day they will. But we are Orthodox Jews. I want to be very clear. They say, we are Orthodox Jews because we do everything that everybody else does. And Hashkaf is always up there for debate. And uh, that's very traditionalistic. And the argument they were making was, of course, as I think I mentioned here at the beginning, if you went back, way back when, Jews, even the most religious, never developed a doctrinal orthodoxy in, in the way that Christianity did. Even in the way Islam did. They never developed a unitary uh, set of beliefs on all details. But rather, it was always very general. Perhaps this is due to the fact that we've never had a Pope and a Vatican and an overarching, direct, top-down <coughs> hierarchy. Uh, but I think not, actually, in my opinion. But, you know, but that is an important fact, that for 2,000 years at least, we have had nobody, even if they wanted to do it, that could impose a, a, a specific set of doctrines down to the details. And so the result is, that one finds differences, for example, in Hashkafa, on fundamental points. I'll give you an example between the Hasidim on the one hand and the Mishnah 
and certainly between the Rambam on the one hand, and uh, you know many of his contemporaries on the other. That in the old days, this is really true, there were a uh, multiplicity of views. Not an endless multiplicity of views, and once in a while, they just got out of hand, like in the Maimonidean controversies of the 13th century. But usually it didn't get out of hand. There were different opinions on the details of uh, many of what you call the fundamentals. The Rambam very famously tried to impose 13 principles. It's also famous that these were rejected by most scholars. And uh, not that they didn't agree with this principle, but they said, who said it's 13, and how you notice an acre, and what does this mean, what does that mean? And so they picked it apart. And that's significant. And so uh, the point I'm trying to make is conservative Jews, as we call them, could say uh, we're just like anyone else. We just have a different set of beliefs about the uh, details of the uh, fundamental principles. This is where uh, St. Gregory Herschel became very uh, uh, controversial, very famous, because he said from the very beginning on in the 1850s that the, everything I just described is a uh, trace. It's not a, <coughs> it is not an acceptable part of the traditionalism. It's not the left wing of traditionalism. He said that uh, wings of traditionalism have to do perhaps with certain practices, but there are certain core beliefs, not details, core beliefs, which cannot be uh, talked away. And uh, when the most significant figure, scholar, in what we call conservative Judaism, Scottie Frankel, uh, founded his uh, Jewish Theological Seminary in 1854 in Breslau, which really gave the conservative movement, as you might say, a movement and institutional identity. Hirsch very famously published a, a public letter in which he said, you say you're going to have an orthodox seminary, what do you mean by God? What do you mean when you say you're going to teach the Torah? What do you mean when you say Moshe Rabbeinu? Do you mean these in broad, general ways? Is it a matter of mythology, which we shall not go into? Or do you actually believe in it? In other words, how fundamentalist are you? That's why I use the word fundamentalism here. Let's get down to the actual details. And the response he got was, get off my back. I don't have to answer you. Who are you? Leave me alone. Which was an answer. And Hersh even said, okay, now that you give that answer, so I want everyone who's traditionalist to know if you send your child to this school, know what you're dealing with. And that means that as far back as the very beginnings of the movement, when many other rabbis, particularly in Poland and places like that, said, these people are religious, they're a little, you know, the Deitsch are a little crazy, you know, but they're... Uh, they're uh, religious also. Uh, in Central Europe and Western Europe, it wasn't like the battle lines were formed. And he said that you're starting a movement based on fira, on atheism. It doesn't matter if you keep shadows. It doesn't matter all the other parts. If you don't have a certain core of basic beliefs, the rest of it is uh, useless, is valueless. These are strong terms in those days. Today they've become commonplace. And indeed, um, by that I meant that at the beginning they started very, very similar, but as time went on and it didn't take too long, they, two movements, orthodoxy on the one hand, conservative on the other end, started to veer at first slowly, but then more radically apart until today. Uh, it's clear, obviously, that the conservative Jews was another form of reform Judaism. So they have always argued that they're another form of Orthodox Judaism. Mm -hmm. The Orthodox have always rejected that. Currently, I think even the conservatives conceive, because uh, they redefine themselves several times, that they're another form of Reform Judaism. They won't use those words, obviously, but you understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hirsch made a big deal out of this from day one. And they said, well, how can you reject the findings of modern history and historicism. How can, you can't just lie. You can't say that history is all wrong. And he says, yes, you can. The, uh, he says, who says that we are bound by uh, what the professors define as the past? As our past. Think about what I just said. One of the very interesting things about conservative Jews, for example, is that by adopting the set of beliefs that they did adopt 150 years ago, <coughs> They put the definition of Judaism out of the hands of rabbis and in the hands of college professors. Mm -hmm. That's where it is today. Uh, you can have a gay rabbi or whatever because the professors <laughs> who define the past and are part of the contemporary academic world will 
advocate and argue that to reject somebody on basis of their orientation is uh, unacceptable. Therefore, it cannot be part of Judaism. Uh, rabbis uh, would never would have said that. And Hirsch basically was saying goes, we don't hand the keys of the past uh, to the historians because they don't actually have a magic wand. Uh, two generations before the crisis of German historicism, he called attention to the crisis of, of historicism. And he was very opposed there for the history, the study of history. It's funny to say that, but it's a fact. And uh, in his very eloquent way, the famous uh, little speech he gives called the Sermon on the Science of Judaism, a speech he gave in Tisha B'Av, where uh, the conservative scholars primarily were in the 19th century uncovering uh, the identities of many authors of unknown slifos and poems and the great wonderful Jewish culture that we call the Golden Age of the Jews in Spain and similar literary achievements of Jews in the medieval ghettos in Germany and places like that. And uh, they really were doing significant work in finding who wrote what and when they lived. And uh, things that are what we call the factoids of history. It's not history, it's the facts out of which you're supposed to construct history. And uh, the people who are doing it, weren't religious, people who are doing it don't recite the philos, but they can tell you when the guy lives. And as he puts it over here, the, uh, a segment of it, he says, we who have, and he's mocking them, of course, this is sarcastic, we who have fully embodied the spirit of modern Judaism, we do not fast, we do not pray, we don't say sleep as our kingdoms on Tisha B'Av anymore. Uh, that's going too far. On Tisha B'Av, we let the old Jews pray sleep and cry kinos. We, however, know much better than they do in which centuries these poets flourished, in what meter they wrote their verse, and whose breast they fed when they were sucklings. We adore, we, we adore Jewish antiquity, that is to say, we love books that tell us factoids about the past. <coughs> and instead, he says, that was not the, our simple-minded fathers, the traditionalists, in other words, did not believe in the deaths of these authors. They, their song, their lamentation, and their prayer lived on in the breasts of thousands of Jews, while their weather-worn tombstones were crumbling in the graveyards. That was the authors of the Slikos and the Kinos, in this case, were fading into anonymity, oblivion, every Jewish heart was their mausoleum and ensured them the only kind of immortality they desired, namely that the song might obliterate the poet, the prayer, its author, and the thought, the man who had given them expression to them. Will these deceased spirits delight in the literary gratitude of our generation? Whom will they recognize as their true inheritors? Those who prayed their prayers and forgot their names? Or those who forget their prayers? but remember their names. And that's his, uh, you know, putting it in, in, in a pithy manner. And you understand what he's saying. There's the discipline of history, which is cold and focused on factoids and has no, what we call in Hebrew, lachluchis, no real connection with the living Judaism. You cannot get it by reading the books. But then you have the other thing. And my point is, he took a principled stand against the entire approach of trying to comprehend the Jewish past through the academic methodology, which is really interesting. Now, many people say, I guess, you're crazy. And he said, oh, am I? And, uh, and there is the fight. And whether the religious world realized or not, uh, that is the ideology of, of the Haredim today, shall we say. You know, they won't necessarily use his language and his eloquence, but they make a principled case against uh, understanding the Jewish past in a certain way. And they argue very strongly that the Jewish past has to be understood in different ways. Uh, as I mentioned uh, last week, uh, Hirsch said that I don't approach the Torah and say, uh, if I were writing it, I would use one name of God. So, uh, therefore, if I see three names of God, that means three, you know, this name of God, another name of God, a third name of God, means three different guys wrote it. Uh, you don't approach the Torah externally. Or you can if you wish, but that's not the Jewish way. Uh, what you say is, the Torah's been around forever. <coughs> it does use different names of God. What's the meaning? What's it trying to tell me? I understand from its internal values, which is a completely different analysis. Now, that meant that Hirsch and people like him versus the modern academic scholars were two trains passing themselves in the night. There was no dialogue possible between the two, uh, nor is there. 
today. Um, and it's a powerful intellectual point I'm making. However, I want to be very clear about this. That doesn't mean that all Orthodox Jews were committed to what I just described. Um, there was another, a second, and very different, a famous Rav in Germany in the 19th century, who's much less known, but not in the 19th century wasn't, a very significant figure, who presented an alternative model to what I just described. And that was, uh, it was real Hildesheimer, who uh, I bet you some of you have never heard of. And, uh, and that goes to show you my point. And uh, Hildesheimer uh, also lived from 1820 to 1899, all the way right through the 19th century. Uh, he was from Halberstadt, which was, as I mentioned before, one of the few communities where the Orthodox controlled everything. That's because there was a family called Hirsch, their relation to the Sensor Hirsch, who were multimillionaires and they ran the show. And uh, he was from a, uh, well, his father died when he was very young. His father was a, a, a Torah scholar, shall we say. And um, he grew up from a very young age, thoroughly trained in both uh, Jewish studies and in secular studies. And he eventually did go to university and get his doctorate. And he also went to the yeshiva for four or five years and got a smicha also from the same person that Robert Hirsch did, uh, Jakob Etlinger, the famous uh, Archaner. Uh, but he had a very different career path because uh, he felt uh, this is a person who is very religious. Well, let me start by saying that. And uh, achieved in his lifetime, among his contemporaries, a genuine reputation for saintliness. Right? Uh, I'm not going too long here because of the time constraints. But uh, really was viewed as a model religious figure. And, uh, and yet at the same time was uh, not only secularly educated, but uh, almost enthusiastic about it. And it's very hard to do what I'm describing to be very, very religious on the one hand, and more than punctilious in mitzvahs, and more than enthusiastic in your Torah study, and at the same time have such significant and strong and positive feelings about the Munichol as well. And yet he was such a person. And uh, as I say, he grew up in Halberstadt, he went to the University in Halle, which was a classic Prussian university nearby, and uh, Smicha, and, uh, you know, what do you do? And he became, at the age of uh, 30, a rabbi. They took him to be a rabbi of a community in Western Hungary. So think about what I'm saying. I told you a couple weeks ago, in the Chassam Sover period, and, and in the period following the death of the Chassam Sover period, there was an explosion of yeshivas. A rabbi in Hungary meant they're basically what they call a typhus yeshiva in the Hungarian style that I described before. So the person who's going to be a rabbi of the community, in his case it was an Eisenstadt, so maybe some people from there, uh, not far from Austria. Uh, he's the rabbi of the Kehillah, of course. He's also the Rosh Yeshiva, eventually has a yeshiva of 200 students, um, which they get at 4 o'clock in the morning for this first Seder and all the rest that I described over there. He also teaches a full, he himself teaches all the secular studies. So this is crazy, you don't have this anywhere else. There's someone giving every day a sheer iyun, that is to say, a pilpul sheer, and then a sheer pashat, which is a bakiyas sheer, for those that I'm talking about, and a halacha class also, and, and a class in the chobos alavobos. And then in other parts of the day, he's teaching Latin and Greek and mathematics and uh, geo uh, uh, astronomy and history and classics. And uh, I saw his schedule. Uh, anybody who's a teacher is going to be is going to scream it when I'm best to talk about. He taught 60, 65 hours a week. Right? And he loved it. That's the point. You don't do it if you don't love it. Uh, I might add, he never had to worry about money in his life because he married one of the sisters of this multimillionaire family. But what did he do with it? And by the way, there's a wonderful story. His daughter writes, he says, you know, he never knew anything about money. The rich relatives used to come pay him visit once every couple of weeks and just go to one of the drawers in the bedroom and put wads of bills in <laughs> So if they ever had any expenses, they had to get it. It's not a bad system. Now the, um, <laughs> but, to be, but on the other hand, never took a vacation. Don't think about that. Understand? He liked what he was doing, and he threw himself into it, and in Hungary, it was highly controversial. The other rabbis couldn't make heads or tails out of it, because they knew that he is more, <coughs> that he's genuinely religious, and more than that, Right? You couldn't deny, you know, you can't fool your students. You know, if you live a public life all, the, all day long, you can't fool anybody. So they knew he's the real thing, and yet, he's also Dr. Heldesheimer, and as I said, Latin and Greek and 
-hmm. geometry and history and a whole bunch of other courses in there. And anyway, it's just an unusual model. He was trying to live a certain model. And, you know, it goes without saying that the students who learned on him became enthusiastic uh, uh, followers of Hasidim, you might say, of him. The first two Orthodox rabbis in Baltimore, and the first rabbi in Sheriff's Israel, and uh, the first rabbi in Chizik Mitter were his students, and uh, among others. And, uh, and, and by the way, if you finished his yeshiva, uh, you got a BA as well. The Hungarian government recognized it because of what I just said as a gymnasium. So you finished, you know, so without going to college, you had all the college courses in the yeshiva, except here it's taught by the Rosh Hashiva. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's a very different model than Hirsch. Okay? Very different model. And I might say that the anomaly was too strong for Hungary. Uh, there are many, many stories. There's one very famous one where the kids of Shulchan Aruch, Shlomo Gonstreet, who wrote the Kitzvah Shulchan Aruch, was a rabbi in Hungary also, uh, visited him once, and eventually enrolled his son in the yeshiva, as did many other famous rabbis. And uh, he said, you know, we were talking about you, but we can't figure out, I was talking to my colleagues. He said, what kind of a guy is this? You know, he walks and talks like a duck and all that, you know. <laughs> it, does, it, does, it doesn't make sense. And uh, Rahul Sumber says, how long were you talking to me? I don't know, an hour or two. He says, during those hour or two, you know, that's when I do my, you know, uh, secular studies. Right? The rest of the time is learning. And it was true. Uh, very different person than Sansa Hirsch, who always, at all times, Maintain an absolute dignity and an absolute distance. As a prince of a school, rabbi of a community, the Prussian government respected Hirsch. <laughs> Think about this. And Rav Hildesheimer was a Rosh Hashiva in the Hungarian style, banging the table, screaming at the students. There are police reports that when he first moved into town, they used to think there's a riot and send the police there every two days until they finally figured out this is just the way he gives class. <laughs> Which is the old model in Europe. Which is the old model in Europe. And yet at the same time, as I said before, uh, he can uh, wipe anyone out in mathematics or in, or in Latin or Greek. Or in, or in many other subjects. In French, in German. I mean, I, I did the list of the courses is uh, mind-boggling. Taught by one person. Anyway, after a while, the anomaly was too strong and hungry, he had to leave. And they just made life too hard for him because certain Hasidic groups and others uh, who were not unpracticed in character assassination uh, were able <laughs> to make the case that he's really a reform rabbi in disguise and all the rest of it. And if you're very religious, you don't feel comfortable, even if it's not true, you don't feel comfortable being characterized as someone from the subversive extreme left. Interesting point. And so in 1869, he moved to Berlin, where the community in Berlin was undergoing a Frankfurt experience where, you know, there was the general community which was taken by Reform Jews, there was an Orthodox minority, they were looking for a leader, and what turned out to be uh, not religious in Hungary turned out to be ultra-Orthodox by the standards of Berlin. And uh, he became the rabbi of the community there. He actually sets up like Hirsch did an independent separate community, although not with, nowhere near with the same bitterness. And he always emphasized took a completely different stance. And he said, unfortunately, because of religious, this I put, unfortunately, because of religious principles, we cannot really find it within our conscience to be within the same Kehillah. But in everything other than that, we intend, we want to uh, cooperate with you as much as possible. So you say the same thing, that's how you say it. Glass is half full, half empty. And, uh, and, and he did do it. It wasn't a, a rhetorical stance. You know, if there's anything for Russian Jewry and there wasn't those days, if there's anything in terms of protecting Jewish civil rights in Germany, if anything in charge of... Uh, of conditions in Palestine. Uh, the a leading conservative uh, scholar, Heinrich Gretz, a very controversial professor, uh, historian, visits Palestine in 19, 1872 and he comes back and he said, uh, conditions are very bad there, the religious community is all uh, not organized, and there are a lot of orphans and poor boys running around, nobody's taking care of them, the missionaries are getting a hold of them. And what we need to do is set up a uh, Jewish orphanage to be run on German principles, by which he meant Torm der He said, oh, you know, let, let the Orthodox do it. And uh, Rav Hirsch and the others all they say he's a liar. And the Jews in, in, in Jerusalem, of course, completely denied this. And uh, it was a big scandal. And Hildesheimer said, no, I think he's right. And I support him. And I'm going to encourage people to send him money. They said, how can you go in and join hands with a heretic against this? He's a heretic, that's true. And I oppose him on everything that he says, but not when he's right. 
Because it's a different way to look at it. And it's a very interesting the correspondence between him and the first one on precisely this issue. He did things in a different way. And most uh, significantly, he set up, in, well, let me put it this way. He came there in 1869. This is just when the German Empire is being formed. Uh, in that same year that he became the rabbi of the Orthodox Minion, Abraham Geiger became the rabbi of the Kehillah. Abraham Geiger being the most left-wing and ideologically formidable reform rabbi, without question. And Geiger said, uh, we have to set up, uh, if we want a kiyom for reform Judaism, which I told you was a, already experiencing a crisis, we have to set up our own rabbinical seminary and train people in the way we want to do it. And, and he was right about that. And so they established one, kicking and screaming in 1872, and 1871 rather, and Rafael Simon says, if they're doing it, we got to do the same thing. We've got to match them. And he did. And in that same year, in 1872, uh, he sets up a rabbinical seminary for Orthodox Jews. And that was the title in German, Rabbinical Center for Orthodox Jews. Uh, rabbinical Center for Orthodox Jews to match them and beat them at their game. Uh, the misfortune for the reform movement was that right when he established the seminary, Abraham Geiger died. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reform seminary in Germany was extremely weak its entire existence until Hitler period. Uh, they always had like uh, 15, 20 students. It was a very, very anemic institution. The conservative seminary was very <coughs> powerful and popular. The reform, as I say, people have a wrong image, uh, was very weak. By contrast, when Ralph Hildesheimer uh, set up his uh, he eventually had a bigger, uh, what's the right word? Karen Kayemis, the foundation fund. Endowment. endowment, yeah. He had he secured a bigger endowment than, than, than anyone else, and the uh, what they used to call the Hildesheimer Seminary uh, flourished and produced rabbis uh, for communities uh, down till Hitler's time. And uh, in fact, Dr. Kranzel was a graduate of there, among others, and and. Uh, this was a strictly orthodox institution, but run on completely different principles than a yeshiva. Because what it meant was that the students go more or less, I'll give you the basic facts. The classes were something like 8 to 12 in the morning, the limonite kodesh. In the afternoon you took your graduate studies over a seven year period to your PhD from the University of Berlin, which was the most prestigious university in Europe. Uh, which means that uh, you won't Bottom line is you won't get your smicha until you get your PhD. That doesn't mean you'll get your smicha when you get your PhD, yeah. mm -hmm. but you get one, 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 one without the other. And uh, it's not a yeshiva, but it was a yeshiva. It was strange. It's, in other words, he didn't run it as he had done in Hungary, but on a completely different basis, because he said we have to match them. And uh, Ralph Hirsch had very strong reservations against this. And he said, I'll support it because I know Hilsheimer and, you know, it's uh, maybe conditions of Germany, we have to, like I said, we have to match. And if we don't do it, the conservatives will take over all the communities, the reform Jews, the reform will take over the communities, so we have to do it. But he was very uncomfortable with it because what it really meant was that the students have to undergo training in two institutions that are radically opposed to each other in terms of ideology. The yeshiva part, shall we say, was 100% religious, 120% religious, and committed to everything that I've been describing. But they know in the afternoon when you go into the University of Berlin, the entire ideology is completely opposed to this. And how are the students supposed to work it out? And you might argue you're not being fair to the students. And he said, I have confidence and they can handle it. And I would say 5%, 7% went off the derech, as they say something along those lines, maybe even as much as 10%, I don't know the figures. Uh, but 90%, certainly not. And uh, he, was, he was that kind of person, where he says, I put my confidence in the students. But we end up over here with two completely different models towards academic historicism, European culture altogether, one being one of rejection, that's a first, who usually is not thought of one being rejectionist of culture. But he wasn't rejectionist of low culture. He was very rejectionist, as you see over here, of high academic culture. And then you have the other model. Both of them were famous, or one of them, that's an understatement. Both of them were looked at as great tzaddikim. I want to emphasize this. 
in their time, uh, and they were. Uh, and yet, they had very sharply divergent attitudes towards how to relate to the uncomfortable parts of culture. Not parts about whether you talk German or English or something like that. Not questions about whether you read the newspapers. Tough questions. And so, the legacy they provided was to, or with this I conclude, the legacy they provided was, ironically, although they didn't, maybe didn't expect it, was to provide a pretty wide uh, berth, a wide range for Jews to locate themselves in. And the key point was, as long as you maintain your fundamentalism, and certainly your anomianism, besides that, well, we can talk. And you could find very important rabbinic authorities who didn't ask anybody else if they were right to rely upon and to turn to, and they together built the model of what we call Torim Der Heretz. And this did prove, or this I really conclude, to work for 15% of the Jews of Germany. So we're not talking about a fantastic success, but we don't have anywhere near 15% of American Jewry that is Orthodox. Think about that. So what do we have, 5%, 6%, something like that? So the model that they evolved proved effective for a minority, a distinct minority, but a significant minority within the history of Judaism. And uh, how this plays out in the 20th century, we'll deal with on some future occasion. Time for a couple of questions. Five questions. Five, five questions. Uh, so we have a couple from the back. We want to, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Ruben. Yeah, I just want to mention that I think uh, uh, Hamburger didn't just say that it's okay. He, he was a shlomo against the uptail. He didn't say it's okay to take the deal. He posited that the uptail is straight. That's not true. He just said it's okay to take the deal? Yeah, he, he was actually in favor of it in general. But depending on certain conditions, you read the writing, so you have to read the writing. If you, and, and, on certain conditions, certain times, certain places, considering the sweetheart deal that they offered, you can do it. No, that's not exactly so. That's not, that's not so. Okay. But also, what's the difference in, is there a difference in ideology between my first and my or just the difference in how they did things in personality? I think there's a difference in ideology. What's the difference? What's the difference? Uh, greater, what's the difference in, in, idea, in ideology between our first and the one hand of Hillsheim and the other? Is it has to do with what you, uh, what you consider legitimate to uh, study and engage with in terms of limited hope. We're first having a much more restricted uh, feeling of what's legitimate to, to engage in. Yeah, you know, there's a question here in the card. What does it say? It would seem, from a cursory look at the Hirsch Chomish, that Hirsch was very knowledgeable of Egyptology, and this was addressing historians that their versions are false on the embalming of Yaakov Avinu. Hirsch was was aware of what's going on around him, uh, and the Hirsch Chomish, as you say, are, are lectures that he delivered in a show that were transcribed. Uh, so he makes references to things like Egyptology and other things. I mean, he was, he, he made himself au courant. He didn't hold it. You should study Egyptology, though. That's, it. That's the point. Uh, there's a lot to say in this subject, but, you know, I have time constraints. And I, I'm not being cutesy about it. Uh, you know, obviously, I'm able only to touch on certain small pieces of it, uh, perhaps on some other occasions. Yes. Good morning. Okay. Go ahead. I have two questions. I know you always have a great question. <laughs> we'll see. Um, first, I was wondering what efforts, if any, the reformers made against the Lasker Law, because I imagine that there were some, and I wondered if they enlisted some of the Orthodox who were supportive of the Kahila in efforts to defeat the Lasker Law. And well, let me address that right away. Okay. Yes. What did the reform do by way of, of fighting politically to make sure that law didn't get passed, that Hirsch got passed? Yes. Is that what you're saying? The answer is they fought a tooth and nail, and the leader of the community was this judge named Maurer, and he wrote his whole um, uh, memorandum to the government. But they could get no Orthodox rabbi on their side because all the Orthodox believed that the law should be passed, but then used as a tool instead of actually implemented. <coughs> this was the argument I was just talking about. Everybody wanted the law passed because, let's face it, it offers you an option. It doesn't say you have to pursue the option. But once you have the option, it provides you with leverage. And that everybody saw as, as, as desirable. What was your second question? Um, if, as I imagine, uh, Rabbi 
Hirsch, in his arguments in letters to Rev. Bamberger, stress the fact that by going with the Hila, he was also, in a certain sense, giving support to this conservative movement, which was taking root. How did Rabbi Bamberger respond to that? He didn't talk about it in terms of uh, conservative, he talked about it mainly in terms of reform, but it, it, the, the correspondence, which is published now, you can get it in the fifth or sixth volume of the collected writings of Sansa Verbs, it's all there to see, uh, in great length. Uh, they took a very halachic uh, kind of discourse, that's what it was. He says, you know, who's, who's, who's described as a mummer? Who's described as an apostate? What is described as legitimate, not legitimate? It's very interesting for those who are interested in questions of Jewish boundaries. But it was mainly conducted on, a, on the lines of, of a traditional halachic discourse, but in German. Okay? So, in other words, pragmatic issues did play a little bit of a role, but a very small part of the uh, rhetoric. Yes, there are one lady here with a teacher, Miss Janke, who is a native Eidenstadt, Mrs. Steinhaber. Okay. She is her maiden of a Schlesinger. I, in matter of fact, uh, Eidenstadt has another notoriety. The Esterhazy who accused Dreyfus, they come from Eisenstadt. That's because the Esterhazy family owned Eisenstadt. <laughs> and the Esterhazy family actually was very good to the Jews in Hungary. Yeah, but later the on. The one you're talking about was a near do well right, who, who, right, yeah, I know, right. who, who, who uh, uh, what's the right word, who lied to, about Dreyfus. How did the, uh, the near law movement in Hungary? Relate or vice versa. How did uh, Rob Hirsch and, and Bamberger and Hildesheim relate to that movement in Hungary, which was right next to them? Well, that's a very complex question because Hildesheim lived in Hungary during those fights, and he adopted, within Orthodox terms, the most left-wing position, uh, which is that they should somehow or other cooperate with the neologs, not in the context of accepting anything with legitimacy about them, but in using the money the government was offering to set up uh, schools and various things of that nature. And he, he had, a, in general, a very pragmatic temperament, uh, which really um, aroused the fury of many others, particularly the Hasidim, in Hungary. I mean, if you read what some of these people write about him, you wouldn't recognize him in the, uh, you know, in the flesh. But that's true about Jewish politics in general. I mean, that's true today. Um, as far as uh, Hirsch is concerned, that's a very fascinating question, and uh, the most exhaustive study of this whole episode about Hungary and the Nilogs and all the rest. I don't know if you were here when we talked about it two weeks ago. Uh, suffice it to say, it's all partial by itself. But if you want to know anything about it, then there's a very famous historian who passed away not long ago at a, at a very advanced age, Jacob Ketch, no relation to me, and uh, was for many years in, in the uh, Hebrew University, a very famous name. And he's Hungarian. So he loved this stuff. So in his 90s, he wrote a book, which he translated into English, called uh, The Divided House, or something like House Divided. And he has all the details over here. And he argues that behind the scenes, Sam Sri Hirsch was pulling the wires to make the big split that took place in Hungary along lines what I described here. So there was connections between the two. But it's also very important to remember that there were different countries and different environments. And Rav Hirsch, all through his life, took the position, nobody tells me to do in my kehillah. I don't tell them what to do in theirs. But you don't know what's going on in my kehillah, and I don't have to ask you whether I'm doing something right or wrong. And that's a very interesting feature of uh, Rav Hirsch and, and also of Hildesheimer, which is they felt very confident in their own halachic position, halachic position, and they didn't think it was necessary to go talk to what we would call today gedolim. Within their own kehillahs, they held that they're the gedolim. And uh, they did things that were very daring, but they bet that the results would justify them. That's how it boils down to it. We have time for, for one or two more. Dr. Shapiro. Uh, I've enjoyed the, the lectures very much. Um, you mentioned Yaakov Katz. He wrote a, a little book of memoirs called in Hebrew, Bemo'e Nai, with my own eyes. Um, what do you think of his version of growing up in a small Hungarian dorf, a little village, so small there wasn't a minion available, studying in yeshiva, in the traditional Hungarian yeshiva, going to Pressburg. From Pressburg he goes to Frankfurt because he wants to go to university. He becomes the Talmud uh, tutor for Yitzhak Breuer's, uh, the grandchildren of, of Samson Foyle Hirsch and so on. And this whole development here... That, he that's something that can only be... Uh, 
Unfortunately, nobody's going to have any idea what you're talking about here. So I'll talk to you, I'll talk to you about it uh, separately. No, seriously, but nobody knows who he is, and nobody knows what the book is, and nobody knows three quarters of the terms you just used. Um, <laughs> no, but, but, but very briefly, very briefly uh, that happened in the 20th century after the First World War. Things are different. But, uh, I'll do one more. Yeah, you said that the reform movement was very weak, but... Uh, isn't it true that there was a substantial population of Jews who were so far left that they could not be classified as reform, especially, for example, the Jews involved in Marxism and communism? The Jews involved in what you call Marxism and communism is a very small minority among German Jewry. Uh, it includes some of the major intellectuals of socialism, but intellectual is not a mass movement. The Jews in Germany, by and large, were a uh, middle class. right? And strove to be middle class, even the ones that couldn't afford to be middle class, as is the case in America. Everybody wants to be middle class. And so, uh, as I said before, certain elements of the Jewish population, significant intellectuals, became socialists and Marxists. But you can't confuse that with the social reality on the ground. The vast majority of people were businessmen uh, of one type or another, perhaps some kind of professionals in the sense of uh, attorneys or doctors. An attorney in Germany is not like over here. It's a, it's a lower profession. And it's, uh, you know, the uh, physicians, uh, you know, uh, that, that kind of thing. Um, and not generally, they couldn't get in. In the period I'm talking about, they really couldn't get in, except in the tiniest numbers into universities. There was one or two professors. That was Herman Cohn. Was it. Very unusual. You understand? Uh, there was a lot of anti-Semitism, obviously, in Germany, even in the best period. And I'm talking about the best period. Now, Legally, the Jews had civil rights after 1869. And those civil rights were enforced. And so, you know, you couldn't harm somebody, you couldn't do it, and he could apply for whatever job, but I can say no. You see? And, uh, and there, as I said before, there were parties called the anti-Semitic parties. They did get votes. But uh, the reason they never got a lot of traction is because the general ruling parties had plenty of anti-Semitism. You didn't have to go and vote for a separate party. You understand? It's uh, there. But that kind of anti-Semitism was not, don't confuse, this is not Hitler. Was not, did not believe in violence or anything of that nature. It's like the feelings that you had in this country uh, two or three generations ago towards minorities, including Jews. Uh, you know, you can't get into here, or you can't get a job over there, but you can certainly function within society. And the Jews uh, did do that. Somebody like Sansa Ravel Rich will say, why do you want to get into that club? You know, where's your self-respect? You know, why do you want to do it? Oh, you kept on focusing the gears. Focusing the whole purpose was to do the same. Back and forth. Just for some reason. Uh, yeah, it's a little more than that. Get on the email list. Uh, yeah, somebody has it. I don't know. It was in the back. So if you, hopefully you'll be in the back. So can we get a tape of this lecture? That's, that, that's why I'm asking people to put names on the list. Where was the list? It was in the back. <laughs> it was. <laughs> in some, they see, were see, making I asked them to put it back. So see, see if it's Give me your names. So I'll call you or... Or assuming you have an email? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, I'm sorry. Find something. Do you have a, do you have a pen? No. Do you have a pen? After Shabbat. <laughs>